I uh, just want to say thank you to Vicky and to the IDSA for providing us with the opportunity to share some thinking today. Uh, in terms of what we want to cover, our focus really is on trying to help South African businesses. Uh, it sounds very altruistic, and I know whenever you get that coming from a man in a suit, you need to take it with a pinch of salt. Uh, but that's really what we'd like to walk you guys through today. And the key around that really, uh, as far as Red Flank, myself and Etienne are concerned, is the business uh, response beyond COVID playbook. And as that sounds, um, uh, um, our, the, the playbook really focuses on understanding the impacts around COVID-19 and helping businesses make decisions in terms of how to take things forward. So, um, some of you guys have already assisted in terms of informing that exercise by uh, providing input by the survey that you completed over the last couple of weeks. Etienne will walk us through the findings from that survey. Um, and Chantelle has graciously you know, agreed to provide a perspective from her uh, base as a scenario uh, planner uh, with regards to you know, what the conventional wisdom is uh, in terms of how businesses uh, map out scenarios that can um, uh, help them navigate the difficult times we're in at the moment. And then I'll go into the playbook itself. Uh, this is very much an introduction to the playbook uh, in terms of uh, what the playbook is and timelines around you know, when the full playbook will be released. I'll go into that later. So without further ado, I'll hand over to Etienne who will pick up on the survey results. Etienne, if you can please unmute your... Okay, thank you very much. I, I have regained control of my mute function, which is always exciting. Anyway, thank you all for joining us this morning. And as you can see, I have a fantastic face for radio. Hopefully that does not distract. I think we are as much as anything else here to understand the data. So I'm going to go into that immediately. If we can go to the next slide. As uh, um, you know, what was very interesting about the first poll we ran today is that there was a uh, a um, uh, similar type of attendance today as what we got from our survey respondents. So far our survey, um, yes, I'm, I'm not visible. I can see there's a comment, my apologies for that. Um, we got a balanced uh, set of survey results from the survey we've run so far. It's still ongoing. Um, we've got over 500 responses to date and uh, we believe this is only the start. We'll get even more, but to date, you know, we have got a split that's uh, fairly even between small to micro businesses, the medium sized businesses of about a quarter, and large businesses of around 17. Okay. Um, if we can go on to the next slide, please. Okay. Now, when the techie hits the tar in terms of how has South Africa responded to COVID, what we can see is that the majority of businesses have actually throttled back, okay? Um, over 55% of businesses or 55% of businesses are operating under reduced capacity. 6% of businesses closed temporarily and unfortunately 1% of businesses closed permanently. Um, about a quarter of the people are operating business as usual, which is commendable. While there has been a couple of uh, fortunate companies that has been operating with increased capacity, but making up approximately 4% of the respondents. We go on to our next slide. As you can see, um, the... Uh, from this slide, in terms of the question that we asked around capacity, there has been a large degree of uniformity across the different uh, sectors from a size perspective. Almost all of the different sectors from large to small and micro have, uh, you know, a third of them have been operating, appro approximately a third of them have all been operating as business as usual. And then you can also see that uh, across all of the sectors, capacity has, however, dropped. Okay. Um, 
Okay. Um, if we go on to the next slide, and um, we are now looking at the actual revenue impact from COVID. As you can see, even though um, a third of the companies hasn't uh, changed under any degree of change capacity, the reality is that 71% of companies experienced a drop of over 20% in their revenue. So it has been a massive knock to all of the companies across the board. And, uh, you know, we expect to see that uh, all of the different, uh, you know, client profiles, there would have been decreased demand. Having said that, going on to the next uh, slide, the the pain has not been felt equal across different sectors, though. Um, as you can see here, the um, manufacturing has uh, taken the biggest hit um, in terms of, uh, you know, a loss of uh, revenue. Um, as whereas uh, retail, you know, has also, um, you know, taken, you know, quite a hit. Um, uh, from uh, the changes, at least uh, initially, where they're up to 20% lower. Um, what's uh, interesting here is that, uh, um, you know, you can see that uh, ICT has uh, weathered the storm fairly well um, compared to uh, manufacturing, for instance, and I think a lot of that has to do with, uh, you know, our remote working realities. Then if we go on to our next slide, um, and this is really, um, you know, the heart of a lot of what we're going to be discussing today, namely our certainty about the future. All of you, you know, are pondering strategies or thinking through or analyzing strategies to respond. A massive part of, uh, you know, your thinking will be around when does the economy actually snap back? And what was clear there is that there is no common agreement around when that will happen. Um, approximately a quarter of the people think it will be one to two years, whereas half of the folks think it will be three to five years. So we have very much different views from the different directors as to when the economy will recover, and that will no doubt influence their thinking about strategic responses. Thank you. Next. I think we're done, Vicky. Thanks, um, Etienne. It's uh, Chantal here. Um, so based on some of those survey results and seeing what has happened in the last, uh, really, we can almost say four or five, maybe six months, um, shock to to the system uh, how does one deal with uncertainty and that's where scenario planning uh, comes to the fore in terms of trying to make sense of the future and beyond COVID-19 what will businesses look like next slide so what is the process for for thinking the future and I think every business and every sector and every industry and probably every individual has realized that um, not only is the world changing so rapidly anyway before the pandemic even hit us but um, since the pandemic hit us we've realized there are many many uncertainties that we have to deal with so it's very difficult to think strategically um, a year ago most businesses had a strategy and um, it was a three to five year strategy. So once you've sort of set your direction, you've got your strategy, it's all about implementation and execution. And I think since um, the pandemic has hit, most strategies either have to be revisited or they actually have to be redone completely. And I think if you saw some of those survey results, there are some that um, are nowhere near business as usual and some that are actually out of business. So what is the process for thinking the future? Next. Uh, Ken Santa and I work together and we have done for over 20 years. 
And our own strategic thinking obviously is built around the use of scenarios and around the use of dealing with uncertainty within the environment. But not only that, it has actually evolved over the 20 years that we've worked together. And um, we've aggregated some great thinkers and developed a framework for how one can make sense of the environment, the current environment, the future environment, and how one can make sense of thinking strategically. And um, I'd like to just underpin it with the six giants that we actually have based some of our thinking and our work on. And the first one is PeerWAC. And PeerWAC actually did scenario planning for Shell in the 1970s and early 1980s. And he actually also worked with Anglo-American and with Clem Sunter in the early 1980s, working on the high road, low road scenarios. But PeerWAC, as a scenario planner, um, said, take the blinkers off. We, we often look at the world through a conventional wisdom lens, through a blinkered lens, and it's often what happens on the periphery that all of a sudden moves into the core and we've missed what happens on that periphery. And it moves into the core and the first thing we do strategically is we become reactive. Um, and our strategy, instead of proactively positioning us into the future, we are reacting in order to survive or perhaps thrive. So take the blinkers off. Isaiah Berlin, a philosopher, he worked at Oxford, um, a professor at Oxford University. He talked about foxes and hedgehogs. Um, his concept was uh, people think strategically either as a hedgehog, in other words, they really feel comfortable predominantly in certainty. And based on certainty, they project a future as a single projected future. And then they base their strategy on that single projected future. Whereas a fox says, hold on, there's too many uncertainties, there are too many permutations of how the dots can connect. I need to see the future through a set of three or four scenarios. So the fox would use scenarios, watch the flags that are coming up in the environment, assign subjective probabilities so that they can start making decisions and put a stake in the ground and then constantly monitor those scenarios to see if something's shifting. So they're incredibly agile and they're incredibly adaptable. Charles Darwin uh, talked about adaptability and you know his famous um, comment, the survival of the fittest, of course all of us in business straight away said survival of the fittest means survival of the most competitive. Um, and that's not what he meant. He meant if you want to be sustainable and you are able to evolve, you need to be adaptable. Karl Popper was a mathematician and also a philosopher. And he said, you know, when you're looking at events, events shape the world around us. And those events can either be clocks. In other words, they are quite predictable events. They tick away and we can strategically work with them because there's a predictability in them. Or the event is very cloudy. It behaves like a cloud. In other words, it moves, it morphs, it shifts, it changes all the time. And those type of events, because they're not predictable and they're so uncertain, we actually need to build some scenarios around them. And I think this pandemic, um, there obviously is a predictability in a pandemic and what happens when a pandemic um, comes into play globally, but we don't know much about it. We don't know where it's going to land. We don't know if we're going to have a second wave. We don't know if herd immunity actually works. So we need to play with some scenarios in order to watch and be able to maneuver very tightly through these type of scenarios. David Hume um, said, reason is the slave of passion. And this is when we come to making decisions. We often make decisions strategically based on emotion. And the problem with emotion is that it's often the incorrect decision to be made. And I think at the moment we're in an unseen uncertainty um, with this pandemic. So our levels of anxiety are very high and we are starting to make knee-jerk reactions that are probably based a little bit more on emotion 
than on pragmatism. So be careful when you make decisions, especially in this type of time. And then Socrates, um, also a philosopher, said that uh, it's a life of questioning. We need to question our assumptions. We make assumptions, and based on those assumptions, we develop our strategy and our strategic thinking. And he said, we've got to question those assumptions. And I think for most businesses, if we look even 10 years ago, you know, the world predominantly the superpower was um, the US, uh, World Bank, uh, the IMF, all of those bodies have been developed on a Western kind of thinking. And we've made assumptions about the rules and regulations of how we do business. And those assumptions are starting to be questioned. And probably predominantly because China has come onto the playing field and our traditional assumptions don't hold. So Socrates says, question your assumptions all the time to get as close to the truth of the game. And then you can strategically play the game to your best advantage. So those six giants underpin our thinking. They all have pieces of our strategic puzzle that we need to connect the dots with in order to work through this type of environment. Next slide. So how do you put those six giants and their thinking into something that's manageable as a framework in order to help us think strategically? So Clemenov said that there are five elements of strategic thinking, and they're based predominantly on our concept of the mind of a fox. So the first thing is awareness. We have to be aware of what's happening around us. And that means that we have to contextualize. Um, and a lot of people are starting, just as an example with this pandemic, are starting to actually say, well, will there be a second wave? And if you have a look at some of the past pandemics and some of the flu outbreaks in the past, there were second waves. But this context is different and we very quickly trying to find a vaccine. So in this context, if we can rapidly find a vaccine, we may not have that second wave that we've had six, seven times in the past. So context and awareness is very important for business. Then looking at your scope, which is, you know, a lot of businesses today have to say, um, is my business model still the right model? Um, should I perhaps be changing? Are some of my products no longer valid? Are my services no longer valid? Do I have to change some of my services? So what is the scope of my business up to this pandemic? And now with this shock to the system, what is my scope going forward? And then of course, who are the players? Strategically, stakeholders are very important in any game because they all have their own agendas. Um, and at the moment, one of the key players in this process is government. Uh, government are setting the rules, they're setting the scene, and um, we actually need to question some of those regulations. But as businesses, we need to work within that framework. And then we need intelligence. And we need intelligence to say what are going to be the rules of the game? What are the certainties going forward? And what are the key uncertainties? And we're probably sitting with more uncertainties than certainties. In the South African context, I think there is one rule of the game and there is one certainty in the next two years, for example, that our economy will contract. I don't think anybody says that's not a certainty. Um, what is uncertain is by how much it's actually going to contract. But intelligence is very important for any company. And then you have to take those key uncertainties and connect the dots and synthesize them into a set of scenarios. And once you've got your scenarios, you can then start playing the game or setting your strategy. You can start to make some decisions. So decisions actually start, first of all, with creating options, analyzing those options, looking at the type of resources that you're going to get from them, and then also looking at the leverage you're going to get from those options. And once you've had a look at that, you then create decisions based on those options. And then the decisions start to have actions associated with them and timeframes associated with them, et cetera. And there's one little piece in decision-making that's become very, very important in the last couple of years for businesses. And that is to put a lens of an ethical compass into play. Is it legal and is it moral? And if it's legal and moral, then it's ethical. 
if you're starting to look at some options that are on the cusp of legality or on the cusp of morality, especially in this context, when we're starting to perhaps look at legal documents and the morality of the pandemic and what's happened, insurance, etc., we need to have that lens of the ethical compass. And then the, the fifth pillar of strategic thinking is to reflect. Know what your meaning of winning is and make it a measurable meaning of winning. So if I'm looking at trying to get through the next two years as a business, and I see in the survey, there were various um, degrees. Some people, very few have said within the next year, we'll be back to business as usual. Most have said in the next three to five years. So in three years time, what is the meaning of winning for your business? And I've been working strategically with some businesses who say something as simple as, well, if I'm still in business in three years time, that is my meaning of winning. It's not even as measurable as any other nuancing. So those five elements of strategic thinking give you the framework for you to maneuver into the future. You might find a certainty, hook it in as under intelligence. You might see a shift in the scenarios, hook it in into your synthesis. You might need to look at a different option in one month's time. And so therefore have some options and then convert them into decisions. So that is the framework for thinking. Let's now just have a look at how those scenarios are so dynamic. So move on to the next. All right, so let's have a look at what's happening. And uh, again, Clem and I have done scenarios probably for the next um, three to five years, but even as close as the next two years. Most businesses would ask us to come in and do scenario planning for a three-year period, a five-year period. But at the moment, businesses are asking us to do at most a two-year, a 24-month time frame. What are the scenarios for the next 24 months? So if you have a look at the global scenarios, it's whether it's one world or a divided world whether we're going to have continued global growth and we're going to see this V that they're talking about from an economic perspective. Based on those uh, two key uncertainties, there are four scenarios. New Balls Please has got very little probability in the next two years to play out globally. We're not going to shoot the lights out as a globalized uh, world with continued global growth. So really, we can say after the financial crisis, we went into hard times scenario where we did go into global recessions. Um, we were still globalized. We were still one world and we had hard times. We then moved 2009, 2010 into the bottom right scenario, which is the UV. It's a two speed scenario. So China came out of a hard time scenario, started to see growth. They put their quantitative easing was putting infrastructure in play and putting infrastructure in play required resources. So many countries in Africa also went into a V and since 2009, 2010, some countries in Africa have seen some very good growth uh, because they're resource based and they are supplying China. And then we've seen Europe, we've seen Japan, um, et cetera, that have been in the U, very slow growth in the last uh, 10 years. So we've been at play in that two speed scenario. But the one that's very interesting now is the worst case scenario, a fork lightning scenario. And a fork lightning scenario is if we go into a global recession or even a global depression, and we now start to become a very divided world. And we are already starting to see divisions and Donald Trump in the US is certainly playing into a more divided world than into a globalized world. And if we do start to see global economic collapse, we're going to start to see a fork lightning scenario. And the pandemic actually could be the camel's straw because if you really think about the debt that's in the system, national debt that's in the system before the pandemic even hit, there is a possibility with all the stimulus packages um, that we could go into economic collapse. Um, just a little point to a growth scenario. Really a growth scenario will be dependent on technology. And we're already starting to see the rapid uptake of technology. We're doing this today based on um, a, a webinar and on a Zoom, but um, technology in mechanization and mining, technology in automation and manufacturing 
I think we're going to be speeding that up in terms of where we can use technology to create efficiencies. And I think if we look at the South African context, if we were to um, consider the South African context, we like to keep jobs. And so therefore, in some ways, and in some of our industries, we're pretty anti automation or mechanization because it could be loss of jobs in the short term, especially for unskilled labor. But I don't think that that's going to hold anymore because technology is certainly globally going to be one of the key players to get us back into growth. Next. So I wanted to just um, put that into context to South Africa. Um, and so, well, if we looked at the next 18 months, what are South Africa's scenarios? And at the moment, what is playing out is two key uncertainties. One is around our level of social cohesion. And when I talk social cohesion, I'm saying, what is the relationship between government, government and business, government, business, other political parties, government, business, other political parties and society? And if we haven't got that relationship and that collaboration and we're working together, our level of social cohesion is going to slip very rapidly down, downwards. And then, of course, the other key, key uncertainty, and we're seeing it every day, is the economic climate. On the left, is it going to be an L? And I think um, I was reading some of the, the thoughts today from some economists, is that there is a possibility that we're going to go into an L. Or are we going to go into a V or a U? I think our best case scenario can't possibly be a V, but we could perhaps look at a U, which is a couple of years in order to build growth in our economy. So if you have a look at South Africa's current position, we're sitting between two scenarios. Solidarity Fund, which is a scenario where our 500 billion bailout came into play and businesses put money in. Um, it was to allow businesses to survive. It wasn't really stimulus for growth, but our social cohesion was quite high when we went into our lockdown phase. But since then, we've now dropped in our social cohesion. We've got a lot of regulation that is going to court um, between business and government. So certainly that solidarity fund type scenario is not a sustainable scenario. So South Africa has got the possibility of going into a free fall scenario with very low levels of social cohesion, increased levels of strike, high levels of inequality playing out and an L-shaped recovery. So um, that's, that's where we sit. There is a slight possibility that we can go to our best case scenario in Kosisekelele Africa. And that really is looking at structural reform quickly coming into play, looking at our debt, looking at wages, looking at an inclusive economy. And there is a possibility that now is the time with the pandemic having hit us to actually be able to reform and to do things correctly and to change and move into that best case scenario. But we would require very strong leadership for that. And then of course, the last scenario is that we do go back into growth, but mind the gap. We go back into big business being the key player and small businesses actually not surviving the pandemic and being taken out of play. And then our levels of inequality are going to increase. So last slide from my side is to say really different sectors have, um, and we've seen from the survey, been affected differently. Some are not even in operation. Tourism and leisure, absolutely access denied. Um, and then we move down to some, as we saw in the survey, that have done business as usual. And a couple of them, a couple of sectors actually have, I see it, I think on the survey was 4% have actually increased their business during the pandemic. So depending on the sector that you're in, you've certainly had a different impact um, based on, first of all, the lockdown, and secondly, the ongoing nature of the pandemic and the protocols that we're going to have to put in play. So it is a critical time to, to have to think strategically. So with that, I'm going to pass you on to, to Lings. Thank you, Chantal. Now, wouldn't it be great, and if we can maybe advance to the next slide, uh, Vicky. 
So wouldn't it be great if we had a playbook? Um, now, I know playbook is more American terminology. Um, when I think playbook, I'm reminded of Michael Jordan. Now, I don't know if any of you guys are addicted to Netflix the way I am, uh, but if you are and you like documentaries, then you might have seen a documentary called The Last Dance. Uh, of course, Americans would call it The Last Dance. It's all about Michael Jordan and his time with the Chicago Bulls. Now, I can't claim to know anything about basketball, but man was Michael Jordan at the top of his game. Um, and that's what really stood out for me. You know, the, the man was, he was an absolute beast when it came to winning. Um, and I guess whatever organization we are from, um, we have a desire to win in some way. Now, if we a commercial business, the win is to produce a good profit. If we an NPO, it's to help communities in the best way that we can. The uh, reason I mentioned Michael Jordan is, you know, it was absolutely amazing. And you guys, if you've ever watched basketball, would see this. At various points in the game, different strategies would come into play. But what always amazed me is the last, uh, you know, Sometimes it would go down to one second, two seconds. And a team needed to have a very clear idea of how they were going to respond to a situation. And the situation could be one of a thousand. And what really amazed me about the Chicago Bulls and Michael Jordan was how they came back from difficult situations in the last couple of seconds to pull through a winning play. And when we talk about the beyond COVID playbook, this is really what we want to help do. As I started saying, uh, you know, in the segment, wouldn't it be great if we had a cheat sheet, if we had a playbook that said, in this situation, do that? Because the reality is, and I think Chantel has underlined that, you know, we can speculate at the macro level about where things are going to be. But if we are a business, we are probably more concerned about where is my next deal going to come from? Where is my next sale going to come from? What product am I going to sell? And where my supplier is now gone out of business, where can I source component X? And if we move to the next slide, that really underlines for us what the playbook intends to do. And I want to reflect on this, right? Because uh, both Etienne and Chantal, uh, I've underlined something you already know. We live in very uncertain times that are almost impossible to predict. And this is something I can relate to personally. Um, Purusha is on this call. So with your permission, Purusha is my wife. Uh, in a couple of years ago, we were in a very similar situation. It was started by a virus and it resulted in a situation that was completely chaotic. Now, I grew up in, in one of the big five consultancies and we were always taught and I learned, and this became really part of how I tackled everything I did as a management consultant, is there is no situation you cannot handle. Um, and I found when Perusha got sick with a mysterious virus that was never diagnosed, that put her in a wheelchair, I realized that, you know, here was a situation I couldn't deal with. And I think uh, this is probably how the bulk of the world, you know, whether you're a business or an individual, would have reacted to the situation we find ourselves in now. The bottom has fallen out. The only constant is chaos. A good friend of mine gave me some good advice. You know, after six months of crying and talking to everyone, his dog and his second cousin, and looking for an answer, which we never found, uh, he said something very insightful. He said, Links. What you need to do is you need to understand how to manage in a situation of chaos. And that's essentially what the playbook is trying to do um, and will do uh, with your assistance. The playbook will identify specific impacts um, and we'll do that, it will do that down to a subsector level. So that will go down to within um, uh, the the retail environment, it'll go down to food, it will be food, it'll go down to fresh produce. Uh, it will help us all understand what the impact is, and then it will formulate some potential responses. 
So Michael Jordan, halfway through the game, leading the Chicago Bulls. Michael Jordan with the Chicago Bulls trading by 20 points in the last five seconds. Now, you're going to experience all of these situations at different times. And you need to understand what that situation is going to look like down at your business level and what the potential responses are. Now, moving into the next slide, uh, this is where we, we, we bring this into focus. So if you look at the green, I'm not going to talk about that. We all understand that at the macro level, there's a lot of chaos. No one really knows what's happening. We know that uh, the situation is influenced by government restrictions. For instance, New Zealand versus the US versus Brazil versus South Africa. We know the restrictions have been different and the government response has been different. But as a business, what you would want to understand is how does this impact people's behaviors? How does it impact what people need? When someone's sitting at home with their cars parked in the garage, they're certainly not going to need petrol. So a petrol station at the low end of the scale or the big oil multinationals at the high end of the scale need to understand the impact. And businesses are people. Businesses are impacted by their suppliers, availability of inputs and so on. So the middle line here really is where things translate from the high level, the macro level down into the micro level, which is the level you are interested in. So the areas that the key drivers of impact that we see are demand, availability of your staff, access to inputs and access to cash. Now, if we move to the next slide, we'll just talk through one example in terms of how those impacts are actually realized. Thank you, Vicky. <coughs> And to understand, you know, how that impact is realized, we need to understand what are the key elements of your business. Now, I'll go through this very quickly. Market, certainly important. Consumers, the guys that buy from you, individuals, uh, running households, behaviors have changed, needs have changed. But you have business clients as well. Channels, we know there's a traditional physical channels, but we also have the virtual channels such as direct. Uh, you've got the offering, so it's your product, the price that you put in it out, and so on. In terms of your organization, that's just typically where your focus will be. And that's wrong. Um, normally, it would be right, but more now than ever before, we need to look at the other blocks. So what we need to say is, how are my business clients being impacted? The physical channel is what I've used previously, but is it now time to consider direct and e-commerce? Down on the bottom right of the slide, in terms of supply environment, we really need to understand how are our suppliers being impacted. Now, they might be providing a component in an assembly in a manufacturer, or it might be a service provider that is itself providing a service to you, uh, providing a service to your end client. But now, more important than ever, we need to understand the full landscape. Now, uh, I think of another basketball player, and uh, I don't really understand basketball, but you know, I understand some of the business parallels here. But LeBron James, you know, uh, I remember seeing an interview where a reporter was asking him about the previous game that he had played, and he was able to run through the game play by play through the entire you know, game, running through all of the sequences. And that's the kind of insight we need in this environment. We need to understand not just what's happening within our business, but we need to understand how all the other role players are being impacted. So if we move on to the next slide, I'll just contextualize how you can use this. And in the playbook, we'll put through, you know, these practical uh, mechanisms and tools that you can use in analyzing your own business. So when you say, I believe my demand is being impacted. Where is that demand coming from and who is actually driving it? So we talked about changing consumer buying behaviors. I use the example of petrol as a simple one, but the more obvious ones are a consumer income. We know that a lot of people have lost their jobs, or they're in short time. In the US, the stats say that more than 50% of people that have lost their jobs will never get those jobs back. Now the question is, how does that impact your business? And we need to understand as well that as far as your business is concerned, it's experiencing a lot of impacts, but your businesses that are clients and that your businesses that are suppliers and that your businesses that are the logistics company getting your product out there or your service out there, 
is actually being impacted in a similar way. So I'm going to skip over the next slide, Vicky, but if we can move on to the one after that, uh, I want to bring this back into context, right? So Chantel talked a lot about the macro environment, and it's very important we understand where that is going. We additionally need to zone in on how is our micro business environment being impacted. And the key things we need to look at is demand, the availability of your employees, your access to inputs. Now, this might be a product or it might be a service. And then more, very importantly as well, access to cash. Now, this is influenced by two key things. The one is, how is your revenue impacted? Because if your revenue is impacted, then the money comes in slow, which means you have a cash flow deficit. But there's a positive here as well. If you have cash in hand, it gives you options that you can explore. And then we go into this in the next slide in terms of how do we take these uh, factors and translate them into perspectives, almost the kind of situations that will trigger different strategies from your company. Thank you, Vicky. So very quickly, what we can do is we can take those three, four factors and pull them together into a space that um, you can use to understand how you, you react in a situation that's essentially chaotic. Um, so on demand, that's very straightforward, is demand for your products and services. And the, you know, is that demand increasing or is it decreasing? In terms of capacity, it's availability uh, of uh, your staff, it's your access to inputs and your access to cash. Now, uh, if we move on to the next slide, what this does is it paints a couple of scenarios, similar to the scenarios that you know uh, Chantal ran through at the macro level, but this is specific to your company. So everything's rosy means your demand is increasing, so you know, people can't get enough of your product, but at the same time, your capacity is increasing. So you have cash in hand, so you can expand your distribution networks as an example, um, but you also have access to people in the marketplace, maybe because other businesses are closing. Dark clouds is where, you know, it's a situation no one really wants to be in, but a lot of businesses are, that's what our research indicates, where both your supply and your demand is down. Missed opportunities is where the demand is there, but you just don't have the supply. So it might be that the critical component that's required for your product is not available because the, your supply is shut down. And then all day stuff, nowhere to go, is where your demand is down, uh, but you have supply. So unfortunately, you aren't able to meet demand you aren't able to, to extend that supply to meet demand. So next slide. Uh, I'll just go through two very quick examples. I want to illustrate that these scenarios apply to the business context. So Amazon, uh, a lot more demand for its products because people are keen to buy virtually as opposed to in store. Uh, and, but, uh, you know, do they have the capacity to get it out there? And that's what they're actually doing. They're moving from a missed opportunity space to everything's rosy space. Uh, if you move on to the next slide. Uh, these are product examples, and, and this is something you'll be able to relate to exactly here, simply. Um, so just before the lockdown, you know, I went around looking for alcohol-based hand sanitizers, couldn't find them. That meant some, some supermarkets that might have had them previously were in missed opportunity space, but once the supply came in, supermarkets then were able to move into everything's rosy. All this stuff is a very sad situation. One would expect that because people need food, that farmers would be in a good position in this situation with the impact from COVID. The sad reality is a lot of consumption of fresh produce is through restaurants and uh, hotels, as an example. So in the US, for instance, 3.7 million liters of milk uh, is being flushed down the drain uh, daily at the moment because uh, the farmers are producing, but they aren't able to actually absorb that through a chain. So I wanted to use this example to illustrate that within your business, you need to understand which quadrant each of your products sit in and then respond appropriately. So I've just got a couple of slides and then I will be wrapping up. Uh, the next couple of slides are very important. So, and these slides will be distributed to you so you don't need to uh, you will be able to access these stats and more detailed stats in the playbook. But if we look at how businesses are responding, some of them are growing. As you can see, some of them are introducing new products, or getting into new markets, mostly driven by large businesses with some initiative from small businesses. The question is, you know, how can you combine that with other ways of growth, such as acquisition? 
And you can see from this that most of the, a lot of the opportunity that's been perceived is in the medium business space. And it's kind of what you would expect. Medium-sized businesses see opportunities to acquire smaller businesses. Some people are looking at alternative distribution. A lot of businesses are looking at rationalization. Now, the question is, how do we rationalize in a way that doesn't cripple us in terms of capacity and capability for the future? And something for, for us to think about as businesses is, in the unconventional space, what can we do different? So something like dynamic capacity planning, if your demand's going to be going up and down, can you create capacity in a dynamic fashion so that you can flex in accordance with that? So the next couple of slides then go into, and we can move on to the next slide. Uh, I'll just go through you know, two of these slides, not all of them, but in the everything's rosy situation, remember that's where your demand's going up and your supply is increasing as well. Uh, this is what our research is indicating in terms of what our business is doing to respond. Now, some of them, they're obviously in a, in, in a positive situation, are looking to exploit that. How can they conduct market research to understand opportunities better? How can they chase additional market segments? How can they ensure that in this positive space, their customers are you know, happy and becoming happier as their experience improves, even in these difficult times? Uh, if we can skip the next slide and go to the last one. Uh, Uh, in these times, it's even more important to understand what your partners are doing and what your competitors are doing. Even if you're in a positive space, and particularly uh, because you are so dependent on the impact that all the businesses are having around you. So if you think back to the, you know, the, the market crash in 2008, one could argue that a lot of it was you know, funny money uh, crisis. Um, so, you know, liquidity in the markets drove up. That's what the bankers would say. But how did the world really change? Um, in COVID, in the COVID-19 situation, that's very different because there are physical changes. People are changing their behaviors. Uh, they are buying certain products and not buying others. They are not traveling around as much. Um, so industries such as the airline industry, it's not just cash that's not available. They are losing customers. So. What is important, and that's what the playbook will help you with, is uh, to help you understand within your sector, within your subsector, what is happening with regard to your competitors and your partners and your customers. How are those markets, how are those stakeholders being impacted, and how can you adjust your business to respond to that? So uh, if we move on to the next slide, and we're now in a position I, to wrap up, and this is really where the tacky hits the tarmac, as Etienne you know, so eloquently put it earlier. Uh, what do you do now? Uh, there are some easier choices, such as remote work, working versus working at the office. So some of the stats we have is that 97% of companies have at least some employees working remotely at the moment in South Africa. 88% of them have 80% or more of their staff working from, from home. 92% uh, of businesses say that they will have some staff working remotely going forward. So it makes you think, yeah? Key decisions you will need to make is, do you adopt a wait and see approach? Um, and that's really saying, you know, let's see how things go. And you wouldn't be blamed for, for taking that approach because very, one, very few people know exactly how things are going to, to pan out going forward. Crystal gazing is where you know, you're a betting person and you're going to say, I believe this is what's going to happen over the next month, three months, six months. Process for courses is really saying, I will adjust the way in which my business operates and focus based on the particular situation I find myself in. And one size fits me is uh, the situation where you believe I've got one strategy and I'm going to stick with it. And I guess depending on what situation you're in, each of these could fit for you. So uh, at this point, uh, we'll run a very quick poll to see, uh, and I know we, we kind of throwing this at you, but it would be good to see what your perspective is. Which of these options would you prefer to pursue uh, based on your current business situation? Uh, so Vicky, if we can bring that up quickly and then I will wrap up on the next slide. Uh, so the first question is around 
uh, which, what situation are you in at the moment? Uh, are you in everything's roses, which is supply increasing, increasing demand for your, your products? Uh, dark clouds is where the um, demand is dropping and the supply is dropping. Missed opportunities is where your demand is increasing, but your supply is dropping. And all dressed up is where your demand is dropping, but your supply is increasing. So if we can get a quick perspective on that. Okay, I'm going to end the poll now. I see there's still a few responding. Just going to give it a few more seconds. Okay, I'm going to end it now. I think it, it shows relatively what the... And then, uh, uh, I'm not sure, Vicky, if you have time for the second poll, or shall we move on? We can do the second poll. So I've just shared the results here so you can see what everyone um, mentioned. I'm going to stop share now and I will launch the second one. Yeah, so in terms of the, the kind of strategic choices that you would make that drive pretty much everything you do as a business beyond that, uh, I've talked about wait to see to one size fits all. The take time to plan first means, you know, I'm not ready to make a choice. I'd like to understand which way things are going first, and then I'll adopt one of the, the five. I'm just giving a few more seconds for our uh, attendees to respond. Okay, I think we've, we've got about 70%. Fantastic. End it there and share the results so that everybody can see it. Fantastic. Uh, I guess it's it's what we would expect. Um, so thank you for that input. Vicky, I'll just wrap up on the very last slide, which is the next one. Now, uh, I, I know you've heard uh, that Etienne and myself are from Red Flank, and I'd like you to forget that. What I'd like you to remember is uh, beyond COVID. Uh, this is an initiative that Red Flank was part of, um, and it's really focused on how we can help businesses in South Africa to move beyond the, uh, the impact of COVID-19. Now, how can you contribute to this initiative? Um, there's a, uh, there's a uh, www.beyondcovid.coza website. There's a survey you can take there that will help other businesses understand the impact that your business is experiencing. We aggregate those results and it helps people understand impacts in their particular sector for their size of business. And these are the results that you'll be able to access in the playbook when we issue it, which will be early in August. We're also conducting interviews uh, with people in industry. So you can go onto the website and volunteer uh, for us to consult with you and that will help us understand your sector and help other people understand the impact on your sector. There's a think tank, which is people getting together, captains of industry, to discuss impact and brainstorm responses. Resources that you can access, there's the Beyond COVID playbook. This is an introduction to that. The playbook itself will be released early in August. And then sector organization specific insights will be included in the playbook as well. And then starting the strategic conversation is the kind of process that Chantal was talking about, because ultimately you need to go down to a business level uh, to understand the impact and to understand your response. So that's it, Vicky. Um, apologies, I know I've talked a bit fast um, and we haven't covered all of the stuff in the playbook, but that will be coming out soon. So please look out for that. Well, thank you, uh, Lings. Chantal, if I can ask you to put your video on and unmute yourself as well and, and Etienne, where I, I do apologize, everyone. I know we've gone a bit over than our usual sessions and thanks for those who are still with us. Um, I do have a few questions that have been posed um, on our Q&A box. So we're going to just do spend a few minutes just answering some of the questions. If any of our attendees at the salon would like to raise um, their answer live, please raise your hand if, uh, and I will unmute you so that you can ask your question. Um, so to have a look at what's being posed at the moment, um, I think quite a few questions here um, for for both of you a lot for Chantel. So let maybe let's Ling, since you've been talking about um, some of the survey results and the playbook, um, 
I've, I've got a question here around, um, Shadrick asked around for the outlook survey. So what was the size of the sample and how representative it was and what is the margin of error? So maybe you could just give a bit more input in terms of the actual respondents. Excellent question. Thank you for that. So uh, at the time that we pulled these results, we had about 300 responses. Um, there was a good spread across different businesses. Uh, in terms of the margin of error, I would need to double check that for you. Um, what we, where we do sit at the moment is on 500 surveys. It's increased by about 200 in the last couple of days. Uh, our goal is to hit at least 1,000 and then move beyond that. Uh, at that level, the margin of error drops significantly. Um, so what we will do is uh, look for the more conclusive results. The interesting point, though, is that, um, as Etienne mentioned, this is perception. Um, so uh, this is how businesses are feeling at the moment in terms of, you know, how widespread that sentiment is. I think we'll be able to make a better call on that once we, we close the survey in a couple of weeks. Thanks, Lings. And another question around the playbook is whether you'll be covering the NPO sector in the playbook. Certainly. Great. Um, so there's, uh, let's have a look here. Um, so Mark has a question around, given the desire to hold jobs and um, yet tech disruption, what do you think is the future path for SA strategy and governance and, go and government? Uh, Chantal, I think this was around when you were talking. I don't know if you want to maybe address that between the two mm. of you. Okay, so from my point of view, um, I think we always knew technology was coming into play and we've talked to the fourth industrial revolution, you know, we've talked a lot to it, but um, not much has been implemented in the tech space. And I think this pandemic has really been a catalyst to speeding up our use of technology. So unfortunately, we're not going to go back um, to to unskilled labor that can't in some form be able to use technology. Um, so unfortunately those, those days are gone. And I think that that's something that South Africa would have to look at in our labor market um, very, very closely. And we're going to have to start looking across the whole pipeline. So coming out of an education system, bringing young people who are more tech savvy um, into our businesses and opening up. So I think it's going to be a far more diverse uh, workforce into the future if labor laws and regulation allow what is actually inevitable. Um, thanks, Chantal. I, I think you've also answered Sharon's question, which was, how do you use the scenario of new balls, please, which results in huge digitization? Um, and what, what do we do for the bulk of our economy or unskills? I think you've, you've answered that as well in, in your response. Um, okay. Posting those so that the audience can see. Uh, Mark Vela has a question around Chantal. What do you think are the specific key C CSFs SA needs to hit in the next three years? I'm sorry. What are CFS CSFs? I'm not sure. Uh, if Mark is <laughs> Mark is still on, um, maybe he could raise his hand and, and I'll allow maybe him. Link. Uh, yeah, yeah, LinkedIn. Yeah, LinkedIn. That is. I think it was, C, uh, it was CSFs, which is probably critical success factors. <laughs> okay, so the question is, what, are, what is the acronym, the critical success factors uh, for South Africa? Um, I think one of the critical success factors is we're going to have to get policy certainty. I think that's one of the key things that's been a real hindrance and also from um, investment purposes. So if we are looking at investment, we need policy certainty. Um, and that's something that the government are going to have to address very, very quickly, as well as structural change of the economy and enabling small businesses to participate in the economy, I think is going to be critical. So it's a bottom up approach um, in terms of an economic cadessa uh, from the ground up rather than government trying to put something down because they're never going to, um, to shift to the type of uh, reform that we need. Thanks. I, I see Mark did uh, confirm that that is what he yes. meant. Um, 
So there's, there's a few questions. I'm, I'm going to just ask all of them. So I'm just going to start from the top, um, Mobara. And I see Charles does have his hand raised. So Charles, I'm going to come to you next. Um, what is the future of the commercial property space, short, medium, long-term, post-COVID-19 pandemic? Uh, I think Mobara uh, posed this links while we were doing the survey results. Sure. I don't know if that's something we can actually answer, though. Uh, look, I have a perspective, uh, but I guess, uh, you know, there's a bit of crystal ball gazing in this as well. Um, the intuition would say that if people are moving to remote working and uh, engagement by customers with uh, companies and organizations in person is, is at a low and is likely to be at a low for some time, that the property sector would struggle. Um, and I think, you know, as a general rule, we'll probably see that. Um, but I was reading in the, uh, in, the bus in Business Live the other day that uh, there is one property company uh, that has reported remarkable you know, earnings over this period, managed to retain most of their rentals. So I think depending on the niche in which you operate, depending on your particular client base, your relationship with them, you know, the extent to which you are able to enforce contracts, I, I think it will look different across. Uh, but I suspect you know, the property sector is going to be closer to the airline sector or the, um, the entertainment sector than it will be to, let's say, banking, uh, as an example. Thank you, Linz. Um, Charles, if you can unmute your mic um, and you can raise your question live. There we go. Uh, Hi, okay. Th thank you very much, um, uh, Chantal, Etienne, and Lings for, for, for a great presentation. Um, my question is, are we likely to see more of a sort of um, co-opetition uh, rather than competition in the market, um, an increased level of consciousness? I, I say that because I think Lings mentioned that uh, the survey essentially is looking to to be able to develop a playbook or, mm. or scenario outlook based on the inputs of multiple people across industry and the different sectors, right? Whereas normally we'll sort of do strategic planning in our individual pockets, we'll be very secretive about our own experiences and this type of thing. So, um, yeah, that, so that's one aspect. And then, sorry, the second one is, um, uh, what's the ideal sort of composition when doing the scenario planning? Because it looks like you need a really broad set of skills to to look at this, you know, um, mm -hmm. consumer behavior, psychology, politics, you name it. Thanks, Ed. Sure. Thanks, Charles. Uh, Vicky, maybe if I can pick up on this, uh, if only to relate a humorous story that, that is relevant. Uh, I, I like, you know, the term, and I, I don't know if I've heard it before, uh, but now is certainly a time for cooperation uh, as opposed to competition, so and the two coming together in terms of working together with your competitors. Uh, and you know, the funny angle on this is when Purusha was unwell, it was the one time where her family uh, or my in laws and my family got together. So, uh, times of chaos is certainly where I think the old enmities need to be put aside, uh, and certainly it's an opportunity to work together. Uh, it, in, in my perspective, it's certainly a time where we need to make the pie bigger before we decide how big a slice we get. And we really hope that the Beyond COVID initiative fosters that spirit. And I think given that the initiative will be uh, geared around individuals making a contribution of their data and their perspectives, which then help everyone understand the sector better, it's kind of pinned on, underpinned by that approach. Now, in terms of the skills we will need to move forward as businesses, interestingly, 52% of businesses in South Africa, according to our poll, indicate that they believe now is the right time for strategic planning. And if we look at the answer to the last poll, or the second last, the last poll we ran, you know, that's the view from the group of people around the table as well. I think, you know, it's not going to be possible to cover all bases. Um, you'd need to do the strategic planning and decide where to place your bets. So, you know, is it going to be on the demand front? Is it going to be e-commerce? Is it going to be rationalizing and reducing cost bases? You'd have to place two or three bets and then, you know, chase those more aggressively. Thanks, Link. Chantal, is there anything you would like to add to that? 
question. Yes. Um, okay, I think um, the, the use of scenarios and building scenarios does require um, as diverse a, a group of participants as possible because then it brings in different views and interpretations. So to your point of, you know, you've got to <laughs> connect the dots between consumer behavior, your supply chain, um, your internal business, et cetera, politics, economics, um, you do have to be able to connect the dots to build those scenarios. And um, the, the best uh, possibility of, of doing that is even within your own organization, if you're developing your own set of scenarios, to have a diverse um, number of participants um, participating in that. Um, and then to the other question around competition, I definitely think, and, and it has been a concept that's been around for many years, and it hasn't really been taken up um, and it's an interesting one as to whether this pandemic is going to bring something like more competition into play or more competition and each for their own with their strategies and their strategic thinking in terms of positioning. So, you know, there is an element of it can't be one size fits all um, in terms of strategy. And I, I think different businesses will um, prosper from being highly strategic and a little less operational in this type of time. Yeah. Thanks, Chantal. Um, very similar questions uh, coming through, and maybe I'm gonna I'm gonna start with um, Jacqueline, who mentioned that I started a new business in November 2019, and shortly be shortly before lockdown, we've taken the time to develop our product line. But what advice do you have to increase awareness of our services? I'm not sure if any, any of you, any one of you might be able to answer that. I'd be happy to pick up on that. Um, so look, just based on our personal experience, because we work with uh, a fair number of corporates, but we work with a lot of small to medium businesses and quite a lot of startups as well. Um, I, I think the key is, uh, and, and for any business, I guess it's a pretty, pretty obvious approach. Um, a business should only really exist to serve the needs of its clients. So. You know the old saying of, I think, therefore I am. Um, it should be, I have a product the customers want, so I am as a business. Um, and I think that should be the starting point. You know, what is your product? What is the need you are fulfilling? Um, and how do you help customers understand that your product is a good match for their need? Now, the fact that you're a startup is, is such a wonderful gift because it means you don't have any baggage from the past. So as a bank, for instance, you know, historically they'd invested a lot of money in branch infrastructure and when e-commerce or, or banking over your phone or the web became more common, the bigger banks were, found it difficult to adjust to that. So you're in a powerful position where you can engage with your customers in, you know, the way that is most suitable for you. Uh, and at the moment, virtual means of engagement are the best. So if you're a service business and you can engage over Zoom as an example, fantastic, I would leverage that. Um, in terms of how you get out there, you know, guerrilla marketing, viral marketing, social media, you know, all of those are very, very powerful tools. So uh, my advice would be to look at those. And if you would like to have an offline chat, you know, no cost, uh, we'd be more than happy to advise you on specifics. Uh, so just pop us an email my email is at the end of the presentation. Thanks, please. Um, Sharon had another question, but I think we have answered this already. The question was around economic structural reform. Um, you know, there's much in the media at present around the ANC moving to more structural reform, but not in an integrated or cohesive manner. So I think we have talked about operating in a cohesive manner already. Um, so I'm going to go into the next one and, and Chantal, if you do want to add more to that, you can. So this one was for you, Chantal. What should corporate South Africa do to minimize the likelihood of going into a football scenario? Um, I think it's a, it's a scenario, sorry, where um, corporates are going to have to step up to the plate and become a lot more um, active than they are. So... Um, you know, a free fall scenario it, it allows, and any 
winning nation would never have a lot of interference from government. Um, so uh, an intervening government, um, high levels of intervention will definitely enhance perhaps a free fall type of scenario. So corporates will have to uh, step up to the plate in, in terms of not allowing that, uh, that to happen. And unfortunately, um, there is very little trust between corporates and government in South Africa, in the South African context. And those levels of trust sector by sector are going to have to be built in order to work together. Otherwise, um, we are seeing a free fall scenario. Um, two more questions. And I see Percy has, has asked and he did he put in the chat if we can still please ask his question. I see he's still on. I'm not sure if, if you can answer this, but his question was, so why have most businesses cut salaries even though there are a good number of companies where, and by the looks of in terms of the survey, are still doing business as usual. Um, so that was the one question. And then our last question that I'm going to take for this morning was from Andrew, who um, said, how important is an improvement in transactional governance in, in South African business um, to the recovery and growth of SME? So by this, he means large and business and government honoring transactional commitments they enter into with SMEs, in other words, paying for goods and services on time, complying with other commercial terms, such as inspections, approvals of service and product deliveries as contracted. So um, th those are the two last questions I think we're gonna take for this morning as we have gone on over. So I'll hand over to you, um, Ling Chantel, to answer that and maybe maybe just conclude from each of your sides some, some last parting words uh, as a summary of what everyone should take away from this morning. Okay, I'll take the, um, the jobs <laughs> when businesses are still doing well. <laughs> um, you, you know, it's the, same, <laughs> it's the same story and I was watching in the UK as well. They were furloughing. Um, I know a lot of businesses where people went on furlough, but they actually were doing quite well, those businesses, and, and businesses were applying for the furlough. So um, it is a very good question and it does come back, I think, very um, firmly into my ethical compass um, position. One has to be very careful morally and legally. Of course, legally you can uh, take jobs out of play, but morally and in this time and when the business is still doing quite well, I think that those kind of decisions will come back to bite some of those businesses. And um, one also has to be careful always when you are cutting jobs that uh, when one does go back to growth, you have uh, you know, the skills and, and those people there. So I think that that is a knee-jerk reaction in some businesses. Obviously, others have had to do it. Um, and there's an, an ethical uh, dilemma there. Links, do you want to do the last one? Yeah, sure. Uh, just as a follow-up to the, the, the point you were making, Chantal, and I guess the original question, uh, Naturally, I guess it goes without saying that the, the information that we collect by surveys or interviews or focus groups is confidential. So we're not in a position to you know, pick on particular companies. But it would be interesting for us to look at the data set to see you know, how many people are saying it's business as usual, but are retrenching people at the same time. Uh, and it would be useful to understand what some of the business, uh, including ethical drivers, are behind that. In terms of the question on transactional governance, um, I, you know, my personal view is this, the time we're living in now is probably one in which it's critical to maintain transactional governance. Um, you know, if we don't honor the commitments that we make um, because, you know, circumstances change, um, the danger is that the entire system falls apart. And unfortunately, the, the businesses that I think that are grappling with this tend to be the smaller businesses because they have limited access to recourse, for instance, you know, the legal route. So they are potentially being taken advantage of. Uh, what we've seen personally as a business is, you know, there was certainly that behavior immediately when the lockdown started. Uh, but we are personally seeing a, an easing up of that kind of behavior. Um, and I think this is an area where big uh, business and government needs to lead the way. They need to shorten you know, payment cycles, as an example. 
ensure that commitments are honored, you know, that loopholes are not exploited. Um, so it's, a, it's an incredibly important point, and I think it just underlines for, for all of us the importance of adhering to the transactional governance. We need it in order for business to function normally and for businesses to recover. So just a final comment from my side, Vic, uh, Vicky. Um, I just wanted to, to say that, you know, this is an ongoing initiative uh, as far as Red Tank is concerned under the Beyond COVID banner. So please do check it out, beyondcovid.coza, and you can either contribute or tap in to see how the initiative can assist you as a business. And I suppose from my final side, um, I think that one has to be very strategic in, in these times. Um, you know, there are certain tactics you can put in play, but I think one has to have a very strategic view at the moment, very nuanced and very tight. And I think that if you're building some scenarios, you should be building perhaps shorter term scenarios, get yourselves to the next 18 to 24 months, and then build longer term scenarios when you see what the context in 24 months time is. So it's a time to play it short with a view to playing it longer. Thank you so much, Lings and Chantal. Thank you for your time this morning and Etienne as well um, for presenting and sharing your insights and information to our audience and attendees and members this morning. I think it was a very successful and informative session from the comments that I've seen on the chat and on the Q&A. I think the attendees found it very informative and useful. So I hope they can take some of these practical tools and guidance that you've given to them and take it back to the business now. And hopefully we will see um, some better businesses and, and growth happening over the next year or so. Um, to our attendees, thank you for joining us as always. Um, the slides and the recording will be made available to everyone. And uh, Lings and Chantel's uh, emails are on the slide uh, before you now and will be in the email that you sent through. So thank you very much for joining us. Please complete our satisfaction survey and let us know what other topics you would like to hear on a Wednesday morning. I will see everyone again next week, same time. Thank you very much.